Well, you know what they say. If it ain't Baroque, don't fix it. Starting the Baroque era. I think we're gonna start in a familiar place, a more familiar place for most people now. We've covered medieval, we've covered Renaissance, we've done a lot of the early stuff that not as many people talk about, and we're finally moving on to something a little bit more familiar. So, the Baroque era. First things first, let's start off with the definition of what the term Baroque means, because in almost every single source I was reading on the Baroque era, all of them decided to talk about the Baroque means this. This is what the term Baroque means. So you know what? I'm starting my video off with it too. So the term Baroque comes from the Portuguese word Baroco, which means misshapen pearl which doesn't make sense to us, but it was kind of used as a term to mean overly excessive and just ornamentative in every possible way imaginable. And as we go through this video today, you will definitely understand why the term Baroque was used. It was definitely put upon this time period by later eras, almost kind of as a derogatory type of word, sort of making fun of the music of this time period because everything, and I mean beyond just the music, everything from this time period was so excessive. Just look at 17th century Spanish fashion dress for exhibit A. We'll get into the details of how that plays out in a little bit. But first, let's go back to the very beginning of Baroque era. So we're coming out of the Renaissance into the Baroque. And let's start with instrumental music this time. This is an area we've really been neglecting up to this point because Instrumental music isn't something that's super written down. However, like I kind of mentioned in the previous two videos that I've done so far, that doesn't mean instrumental music didn't exist. In fact, during the late Renaissance period, we're starting to see more and more instrumental ensembles popping up. But like I said before, music isn't being explicitly written for these ensembles. These instrumental ensembles were typically known as consorts and were most popular in a lot of English and French courts. The term consort by itself tended to refer to a group of performing instruments typically of the same kind of family, so all recorders or all string instruments. However, later on into the Renaissance and as we start to transition into the Baroque, the term consort could also refer to mixed consort, which was a group of mixed instruments. So no longer is it just one family, now it can be a variety of things. And this sets us up for the beginnings of the orchestra as we know it today, particularly when we start to see the combination between wind and string instruments, because obviously that's mostly what our modern day orchestra is. It's a lot of string and a lot of wind instruments, but it's not referred to as an orchestra initially. And of course, these instruments aren't just playing in groups by themselves. We're most commonly seeing them being played alongside vocal parts. So like I said in my Renaissance video, there's a lot of genres of Renaissance music that have some kind of instrumental accompaniment. And as we go into the early Baroque, we start to see scoring for that appear more and more. For example, the organ was one really common instrument that often accompanied a lot of vocal groups. And the music that organists would play from would either be a specific organ score or an unfigured bass line. Or in other words, just the accompanying bass line of notes and nothing else. It's not a full on score. It's not what are all 10 of your fingers playing. It's typically a note by note, single line in the bass. And a lot of accompanying instrumentalists of this time would see this and know exactly what to do with it. Typically that meant they had to improvise because the vocalists were singing something else and the organists or the harpsichordists or whatever instrument was accompanying 
saw that bass line and knew that they had to fit in certain types of harmonies. Now, composers could sometimes write in a specific harmony if they wanted something done. They would do this by writing in sharps or flats or different numbers to represent certain specific harmonies that they wanted done. The performer would then see these figures and make sure that they incorporated them into whatever harmonies they were improvising. This was known as figured bass. So unfigured bass is just the bass line. Figured bass is the bass line plus any additional accidentals or specified harmonies that the composer wanted performed. And this whole style of writing is what's known as basso continuo. And this would accompany singers in a wide variety of vocal genres. In the early days of basso continuo, the instrument that would often accompany these vocal groups was typically one that was very harmonic. So keyboard instruments and string instruments were the norm. But later on in the period, other instruments were added to kind of reinforce that bass line. So this could be instruments such as the cello, the bassoon, or the viola da gamba. And this basso continuo style of writing really started to move away from that equal partness that the Renaissance era had. So no longer was it just completely balanced between all of your parts, now the focus really started to turn towards the bass and a lot of bass-led or bass-emphasized composing. Along with this emphasis on the bass, this really started to change the way a lot of composers started to think about harmony. So before, with polyphony and equal parts, harmony was typically thought of as the individual intervallic relationships between each other. So what interval do these two lines make, and these two lines, and these two lines, and these two, how do they fit together, but more on a pair by pair and individual basis. But now that we're focusing mostly on the bass, composers start thinking more vertically with the harmonies overall. And this is where we start to see the idea of chords. And so instead of just writing out individual lines, now we have lines that fit together and create certain chords. Along with that, we also have the idea of tonality rather than modality. So I didn't really talk about this too much before because it wasn't super prevalent to the music that was being composed, but sort of the idea of how composers decided what key signature they were going to write in before key signatures were a thing is they used church modes. So this is things like Dorian, Mixolydian, Phrygian. You're probably super familiar with these if you've done any bit of jazz because jazz music nowadays tends to use a lot of these modes. But prior to key signatures, church modes were what most people used to kind of give themselves a set of notes to work with. And it wasn't that these church modes had a home note like we do when we have tonality. It was just more this set of a scale of notes that you could use. But when we move into tonality with our major and minor keys, now we have this sense of a tonal center, a home note, our, our tonic basically. And that along with our chords is really what we get a lot of our foundational basic composing techniques that we have today. And of course, if we have official chords and our key signatures, we also have a more clear idea of what consonants and dissonance are. So before, like I said, back in the medieval era, there was certain ideas of what dissonance meant. In Renaissance era, they really started to let up on the ideas of what intervals you could use and what intervals you couldn't use. But in the Baroque era, they start to let up even more and allow a lot more dissonance starting to come out because now we can clearly define what is consonants. Well, consonants are the notes that fit perfectly within the chord that we're trying to create. And dissonants are any notes that don't fit into that. And so we can use them in passing or we can use them to kind of set up 
one specific type of cord. They can be used in a variety of ways and they don't have to be completely and totally avoided. However, the more composers started experimenting with this kind of stuff, the more they started breaking the old rules that were set up beforehand. And this really ticked certain people off. One man in particular, Giovanni Maria Artusi, really got upset at what one composer, Monteverdi, was composing in a lot of his music. You see, there was a lot of old rules that had been sort of carried over from the Renaissance, and Monteverdi was starting to write more madrigals and masses and a whole bunch of other works that were no longer following these rules. There was a lot more dissonance and the ideas of when you could have dissonance and when you couldn't. Monteverdi was breaking a lot of those rules, and this ticked this one guy off. So he wrote this big, huge paper about it, essentially, criticizing Monteverdi on why are you just flagrantly disregarding the rules that we already have established. So Monteverdi responded back in a brief writing, and he put that the old practices were what he considered to be prima practica, and the new ones he was currently composing were what he called seconda practica. And with prima practica, the whole emphasis was on the notes and the rules. And so we have these rules of when you could have dissonance and when you couldn't have dissonance. And so we focus very heavily on the notes. But Monteverdi argued that with seconda practica, the newer set of rules, our emphasis should now focus to the text and what the words are saying. And so if we're gonna focus on the words, then we need to have the music fit the words rather than the words fit the music. The really cool thing about this was Monteverdi didn't argue that one was better than the other. He said each had its own use and its own place. It really set the baseline going forward as to how composers should start thinking of and viewing the music. Now, the Prima Practica wasn't true Renaissance music. It was more so the composing practices that composers had coming out of the Renaissance and being in that early Baroque period. But that Seconda Practica really flipped that idea on its head and said, look, we have these older styles of composing, and now we have these newer styles of composing and the ways of looking at the music. And what this really did is it really allowed a lot of composers to put this emphasis on the text and put this emphasis on the performer. Because during the Baroque period, one of the biggest things we will see across the board is this idea of improvisation and ornamentation. Unlike a lot of music that we see today, performers back then didn't really strictly honor what the composer had put into the music. It was pretty much expected that if you were going to perform a piece of music, you were going to ornament on top of it. You were going to improvise on top of it. You were going to add to it in a specific kind of way. In fact, this whole idea of ornamentation was so insanely popular that there was numerous amount of treatises written on the subject of ornamentation and how to decide what kind of ornamentation you should do and when to perform it and when to put it up in the music. And there was rules upon rules just for the ornamentation and teaching people how to ornament music. It was so expected that you would change it from the composer's original just blank music that he put out there that people had to put out these books to teach singers how to sing the music. But like I just mentioned, a lot of this stuff we're seeing pop up in solo vocal music, something we haven't really seen too much before. Most of our vocal music up to this point has been pretty choral, multiple voices singing, multiple parts singing. But it's during this time period when we see a lot more solo vocal music put out. Because of one very important genre in particular that is really truly born during this time period. And that is the opera. Yes, we all know and love the opera that becomes so just insanely popular and influential from the Baroque era going forward. Everybody, everybody loves a good opera. So how did opera come about? Well, you know, throughout most of human history, humans have always performed. Humans have always done performances and plays and dramas. So that part is nothing unusual, but it's really the addition of the music to 
dramas and plays where we start to see the predecessors to opera. And these predecessors did appear during the medieval and renaissance era. For example, the medieval era had their liturgical plays. In the renaissance era, they had pastoral plays. And music was typically played alongside these plays and just as kind of an accompaniment. But it wasn't like people sang a lot through them. However, one area that we did see a little bit more of the music being performed was in the intermedies between the acts of Renaissance plays. In these intermedies, it was pretty common since the stage didn't typically have curtains which they could close to show the end of a scene or the end of an act, the intermedies were meant to be as an interlude. And it was during this interlude that you could have a lot of musical events such as magicals or dances or solo singing and as time went on these would eventually get to be more and more and more elaborate with full costumes and full sets and just again we're getting into baroque excess of everything just trying to build up and be more elaborate and crazy than the last one so the set up for opera had been there for quite a while. We had the music, we had the sets, we had the dramas, and now it was time to put them all together. So in 1598, we see the very first true example of an opera with Perry's Daphne. Now we don't really have much of this opera anymore. A lot of this has really been lost. The first opera that we do have most of it surviving is Perry's L'Euridice. If you'll notice, a lot of these early operas really start to take from Greek dramas. And that's because during this time period, a lot of people really romanticized a lot of Greek dramas. They, it was a popular running theme to perform Greek stories onto a stage. And so the early operas also took from a lot of those old Greek stories and turned them into full-blown performances. So these first few early operas really got popular because people like seeing performances. But the one that really got opera going was Monteverdi's L'Orfeo. Now, the performance of L'Orfeo didn't last too terribly long, but other composers really started to grab onto this idea and over the Baroque era, opera exploded. It got massively huge and people just started writing operas left and right. And yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good brief overview of some of the really big major innovations that we see. I'm not gonna cover them all. There's no way I can cover all of them in one small little video. I mean, this one's already gonna be long enough as it is. So what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna cover uh, some of the major genres of music that we'll start to see going forward. Because really during the Baroque era, there's so much innovation going on that it's really hard to talk about all of it. So I'm gonna talk about several of the major genres of music and where they kind of came from, as well as obviously like last times, the major composers of this era. But first, major genres. So obviously we already talked about opera. That's the last thing I kind of left off on. So opera is, like I said, big, huge set performances, everybody's on stage singing. And operas typically consist of several different types of musical works all within one performance. So a lot of times they'll have big choral works. You know, they could have had magicals in the earlier days, but they it eventually comes to be like they have big choral works, they have solo vocal works known as arias, and in the Baroque era the most common type of aria was known as a da capo aria, in which there would be a first section and then a second section and then you'd go back to the beginning and sing that first section again. Again, with our whole rules of ornamentation, another really common thing with da capo arias is when you sang that first section, when you did the da capo, went back to the beginning, you don't sing that the same way twice. You have to ornament it, you have to add on to it. It's very, very, very expected. But this style of aria allowed for the rules of ornamentation and so it, it was the most 
common type of aria that you'll see in a lot of these Baroque operas. Also within operas, there's still also instrumental ensembles and pieces because like I said, now we're starting to compose more for instrumental ensembles and they typically have their own pieces within an opera. Alongside operas, we also have oratorios. So with the flourishing and popularity of opera, the church decided to take on this whole idea of an oratorio as well. So oratorios are very, very similar to operas, except they are strictly sacred. They're always about some kind of biblical text or biblical story. And instead of having a big production on stage, they were typically performed in a church. So we don't have the set and we don't have a lot of acting. It's typically with a choir and some solo singers, some instruments, and typically a narrator rather than a lot of individual characters. I should also mention briefly that previous genres such as the mass and the madrigal and motets also continued into this era. Mass is obviously going to continue on and much further, further, further on down the road, but madrigals and motets to a certain extent start to die out. Going back to instrumental genres, there's a whole lot of instrumental genres, but I'll talk about a few in particular here. So first up, the concerto. So sonatas exist during this time, although sonatas tend to be more of a solo instrumental piece, but concertos were probably one of the biggest genres for full-blown orchestras. And obviously Vivaldi is probably one of the best known composers for concertos. So concertos were pieces that were typically written for a full orchestra and an individual solo performer. They also tended to follow a three movement format. So the first movement being faster, the second movement being slower, and the third movement being fast again. This was kind of set up by a few composers, but Vivaldi really standardized this whole three movement process. Other instrumental genres that we'll see are things such as suites. So suites tend to come from a lot of French and German composers, but I'll emphasize the French ones in particular here because I want to make a point that I need to touch briefly on, but really deserves its whole own video. And that is the French Baroque music that was coming out during this time. So prior to this, we talked a lot about in the Renaissance, a lot of French music was coming from the church. They had their own secular genres as well. But during the Baroque era, we really see the rise of King Louis XIV. And he has a major influence over how French music sounded in the Baroque era. He really saw himself as sort of a patron of the science and art. And so because of that, it influences a lot of the composers of the time. And one of the biggest things of King Louis is he really enjoyed a lot of dance. So suites tend to be a collection of a variety of dance music, which is obviously going to be very instrumental. Dance music doesn't tend to have voice at all. So during this time period, we really start to see the development of a lot of dance music and ballets also, which is another genre of music that I should mention briefly here. But like I said, that really deserves its own video to go into the details of everything that went on there. I just figured I'd make a little note right here. And then of course, we have to talk about the fugues with instrumental music. Fugues are probably most well known with Bach and a lot of German composers because during the whole Baroque era, French music is a lot of dance. Italian music is really dominating with operas and the Germans have the keyboard music more than anything else. So a lot of our keyboardists and organist composers are coming from the Germany region. And fugues are probably the best examples out of all the genres of keyboarding music that came out of the Baroque era. Fugues are kind of continuing that tradition of polyphonic music that we had during the Renaissance, but it's now going mostly into keyboarding music. And with our new ideas of composing, so now we have key signatures and now we have chords, fugues are really able to do a lot more with polyphonic music during the Baroque era. So fugues are very imitative, which basically means you have one line playing a melodic idea, a second line 
restating that melodic idea, another line restating that melodic idea, and so on and so forth. And they all kind of play off each other and they all sort of imitate the various melodic ideas that pop up. But now with key signatures, now we can have a very specific relationship between the lines. So one line will start off in the tonic key and the second line might imitate that same melodic idea but do it in the dominant or the fifth of that scale. And this really differs a lot from the Renaissance polyphony where it's just more those kind of, like I said, the intervallic relationships between the lines. And finally, the last kind of genre I'm going to talk about is the cantata. Now the term cantata really changes its meaning depending on when you're talking during the Baroque era. This whole time period between 1600 and 1750 has a lot of changes going on and a lot of genres don't always mean the same thing even within the Baroque era. And cantata is a really good example of that. So originally a cantata was typically a secular piece of Italian solo singing music. But if you're familiar with Bach's works, you'll know that that is not at all what Bach wrote when he was writing a cantata. And that's because when cantatas really started to gain popularity is with the Germans who took that Italian word of cantata to use in a lot of their German Lutheran sacred music. So in the late Baroque era, a lot of church composers write cantatas for choirs and it really ends up being a larger kind of work similar to a mass, but it's meant for a specifically German Lutheran setting. Okay, and then finally, moving on to the major composers of this time period. So first off, I'm gonna start with Monteverdi. I mentioned him a few times. He is the best example of that early Renaissance, Renaissance. He is the best example of that early Baroque style. So coming out of the Renaissance, going into that early Baroque, he writes a ton of stuff, a lot of sacred works, a lot of masses, and he writes eight books on madrigals. He of course really helps to popularize a lot of operas too. So he's an Italian composer writing all across the board in terms of genres, and a lot of those genres of what was popular during that early Baroque time period. He's the one that really starts to create that idea of seconda practica, where we emphasize the text over the music. Schutz is also a really great example of this early Baroque time period as well. So Schutz is a really great example of Germanic vocal music. We haven't had a ton of great examples up to this point, and that's because Germany wasn't really too prevalent during the medieval, there was a lot of religious turmoil going on during the Renaissance, and it still takes a while in the early Baroque because there's a lot of wars going on, which is also kind of why England has its own problems. But once the Thirty Years' War is kind of finally starting to come to an end, Schutz, who's composing during this time period, is probably a really great example of what German vocal music really sounded like for early Baroque composers. Vivaldi is another really good example of kind of that sort of mid going into late Baroque time period. So he's really well known for his concertos, like I said before. Once we see the development of the violin, Vivaldi's really known for a lot of his string and violin type music. And he really takes advantage of a lot of the instrumental side once a lot of those instrumental genres start popping up. However, he does have a really good selection of lots of vocal genres as well. Handel. Handel's probably the best known English composer. He's not English. Unlike a lot of other composers who were sort of staying in their area, Handel did a lot of traveling during his life. He was born in Germany, uh, but learned from a lot of Italian stuff and really ended his life in England, taking advantage of the kind of black hole of music that England was suffering with, because yet again, England's politics are affecting their music, especially after the death of Queen Elizabeth the first. In fact, it was again during this time period that 
England is really delayed into getting into the whole Baroque era, and it's not until like basically halfway through the Baroque that they start finally getting into the Baroque era. But once people like Handel start finally coming over to England and really helping them learn a lot of those Baroque techniques, England really flourishes, and Handel especially helps produce the genre known as English oratorios. So they're basically like oratorios, but they're now in English. Handel writes other genres, he writes operas, but operas don't really take off in England as much as oratorios do. And then last but not least, we finally have Bach. I was almost going to talk about a few other German keyboard composers because there are several other good examples, but I figured if I'm going to stick with the essentials, I, I might as well just stick to Bach. And Bach is a great example of all of the above. Well, except for operas, but all of the above, basically, of everything we've talked about. He's very ornamentative. He's very improvisational. He writes a ton of keyboard music. He writes a ton of sacred music. He writes so much stuff. It's insane. And he is ha often hailed as one of the greatest composers of all time. Not just the Baroque era, but like of all time ever, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> now obviously want to clarify talking specifically about Johann Sebastian Bach because there were like thousands of Bach composers. Okay, not thousands, but there were hundreds of Bach composers during this time period because the Bach family in general were all just musicians and composers. But Johann Sebastian Bach is the best well-known and probably the greatest amongst all of them. He wrote a ton of stuff for the Lutheran churches, and he also wrote a ton of keyboarding music as well. And yeah, so that's obviously not everything in terms of the Baroque, but that's probably as good of a blanket covering that I can get, because there's so much content here that just comes out and just is developed and created during this time period that I have to create many, many more videos to really get into a lot of the nitty gritty. Obviously, I'm also not gonna be able to cover all of the big composers. So if I missed a big composer that you really enjoy from the Baroque period, let me know down in the comments below and maybe I'll look into doing a video on them in the future. So yeah, so next week uh, we're getting back into the next era with classical music and kind of setting up for that. And if you are enjoying keeping up with this whole series, of course, subscribe to the channel so that you can stay tuned with the videos that I put out. But otherwise, I hope you enjoyed today's video and I'll see you next time. Goodbye. Do I close the windows? Should just in case. After all that trouble, just don't get to decide to close it. <laughs> Did I really?